there's something about that game. I played it over summer vacation that really speaks to like no school, no homework, do your chores and then play games all day. It really encapsulates like childhood innocence how memorable everything is where you know that you, you remember everything about each scenario each locale each character you know the way the game made me feel when I was a kid was very specific and there's just there's something it's it's comforting I think to adequately describe Earthbound, you have to just preface it with this is one of the weirdest games you will probably ever play. I'd say take all the preconceptions and tropes you think JRPGs are known for and throw them away. Earthbound is a psychedelic, irreverent, quirky. It is quirky. It's a game where you order pizza and it actually takes several minutes to arrive. But it also gets, gets very dark though, and deep and philosophical. There's no armor, there's no medieval themes. It's just kids on a journey. And there's something so pure about that. Aliens have invaded, the future is going to be destroyed and it's up to you to solve all of this in a way that doesn't make any sense. It's basically every kid's dream to leave home and go on some big grand adventure where you get to go buy a bunch of stuff, make new friends, eat tons of food that you're not supposed to, but most of all, defeat some evil alien threat. In typical, RPGs, you think you fight like fantasy creatures, but in Earthbound you're fighting giant piles of barf, you're fighting possessed road signs, a cup of coffee, who could say? Like there's so many things you're gonna punch in the face in Earthbound. See the question's kinda tough because I feel like, you know, it, it was such a weird game for the time, but maybe now that it's, it's, it's had its moment in the sun, it's maybe not so weird and, and crazy anymore. Maybe it, it depends on who I'm talking to. I might say, hey, it's like the it's it's the game that inspired Undertale. Set in a Japanese man's vision of 1990s America, instead of a knight, you play as a young boy with a baseball bat. The dialogue is mostly comedic, and the characters are strange and heartwarming. A Japanese writer's like view of America, almost as if they only knew America through pop culture. So, like someone whose idea of America is like the Beatles and uh, apple pie. <laughs> you know? Like if somebody built their concept of America from American movies, what a, they make an RPG that's about a kid with psychic powers. He doesn't, there's no swords, there's no dragons. That's, that's Earthbound. So I think the first time I heard the name Earthbound was actually in Super Smash Brothers. I think most people would say the Super Smash Brothers series, having the characters Ness and Lucas in those games. I, I just just assume they're from a game that I just I didn't know, but they always looked like they belong. They always looked like Nintendo characters. I played Smash 64 on release, and my favorite character was Ness, and my best friend's favorite was Captain Falcon, and neither of us had any idea who the heck either of them were. <laughs> Mario, I knew Pikachu, I knew Samus, but this kid? I'd never seen him before. These look like Pokemon characters mixed with Kirby characters. And then when you unlock him, he's on the Kirby stage, and so I thought maybe he was from a Kirby game, but he's using psychic powers, so I thought, well, maybe he's a Pokemon trainer that uses Mewtwo's moves, and so it wasn't until I went to the data screen and then saw, oh, Ness is from this series called Earthbound. I know there's something, there's something of a novelty when you see a character like that that you've never heard of, you've never heard of the series. And, you know, I never even saw saw Earthbound the game until well after Super Smash Brothers. And part of the reason for that may have been because Earthbound never released in the UK, never released in Europe. It's just America and Japan. And so in 2013, when it released on the Wii U eShop, of course, I downloaded it the moment I could. And I loved it so much that I had to secure a Super Nintendo cartridge. There's just something so special about it. But when Smash 64 came out, I was 10 and I did not have the internet at home and I did not know the characters that were in the game. They weren't put in Nintendo Power? No, it was not, uh, it did not spoil the characters okay. that were in the game. 
it was a Saturday morning. Random chance, I decided, I don't know why I did this. I decided to change the amount of lives that I started with, because in order to unlock Ness, you have to be playing on normal with three lives. You can go up to five. And as a kid, I just always put it on the max, because like, why would I not? Yeah. For whatever reason. I set it to three, and I got through the classic mode, and then it said Challenger approaching, and it was Ness. I did not know Ness was in the game. Earthbound was already my favorite game. Earthbound had been my favorite game since the day that I played it. And when Ness showed up on the screen, I I started shaking. I was like, I can't believe this. This is this is my favorite. This is my favorite character. This is my favorite video game. And I lost. <laughs> I lost that fight. I lost to Ness. But I remember running out into the living room where my mom was, and I was crying and I was screaming. I was like, Mom, Mom, Ness is in Smash Brothers. Ness is in Smash Brothers. And she did not really understand what was going on, but she was happy that I was excited about something. <laughs> I didn't learn about Ness and Earthbound until my grandpa and I played Super Smash Bros. Melee on the GameCube. And now I did have Smash on N64, but I was terrible at the game and actually still am. And so I never unlocked Ness in Smash 64. As time progressed, you know, you start to hear about all these other things revolving around Earthbound and just how good of a series it really is, how it's not just characters in Smash Brothers, you know, there's so much more to it. And just the fact that there's only three games in the series and two characters are in Smash Brothers really speaks volumes to how impactful and, how, and important the series is. My best friend was really interested in playing it, but she couldn't find a copy. She played a lot of Smash Brothers and mm -hmm. wanted to know about Earthbound because of Ness. We found someone at our school who had a copy and they had the guide in page protectors. They had cut every page out perfectly to put in page protectors. And he lent us the guide and the cartridge. After school every day in high school, I would go over and watch her play it. And I really enjoyed reading through the manual and watching her play and getting to see everything about it. It was in my friend's floor, his dirty floor. And he was like, here's, here's the games you have to play. It's Chrono Trigger, it's Super Metroid, it's Earthbound. And so we popped Earthbound into his messy, messy bedroom one day. My grandma plays video games and my aunt plays video games. And they have and they've lived together for as long as I can remember. As a little girl, they were always showing me these new video game franchises that I had never heard of. I'm talking The Legend of Zelda, might have heard of that one, or Final Fantasy. And one weekend after my parents and I had gotten home from a weekend getaway at the ocean, my aunt, who had been house sitting for us, gifted me Earthbound. And what was so cool about it was that it gave me, a young child, common ground with my aunt and my grandma on a level I had never had before. Well, now, you know, I'm an adult, so I can talk about adult things with my aunt and my grandma, like bills and taxes. But back in the day, you know, we, get, we were able to talk about video games, and I think that really did a lot for our relationship growing up. My earliest memories were going over to my friend Charlie's house, and he had a very bizarre family, so he was very quirky, you know, very uh, hippie in nature. And that kind of played into the themes of the game really well, so I kind of... When I think about Earthbound, I think about that moment where I was in an environment where the game kind of played into my surroundings to a degree, and then I took it home and I really got into it. Uh, I must have been, you know, 10, 11, 4th, 5th grade, and, uh, you know, this was 95, 96 when, when, it, when it came out. You could still rent the game when I first played it. The first time I ever got to experience it was in a blockbuster video, which really dates everything about this video. I was drawn to the giant box, uh, especially in, in Blockbuster, where you can actually like tangibly pick up the box read and hold it and read it. it. Mm -hmm. And I knew right then, I was like, I, I, have to, I have to play this game. And I rented it multiple times before finally buying it. My brother was way into RPGs. You know, he got me onto Final Fantasy uh, 2. Four. He got Final Fantasy 3 slash 6 day one. And so I grew up like with a lot of RPGs. And uh, I think a friend of his had a copy of Earthbound. He was just like, you got to play this. It's so weird and different. And I went to it immediately. I loved it. And this was right when it was still pretty, pretty new. I you know, played it and beat it that summer. I think that was the only copy that I had for a while. And then I was able to buy a copy 
uh, for 50 whole dollars uh, a couple years later in 1999 or 2000. At some point later on when the game was being discounted, unfortunately, it was in the bargain bins at this point. I eventually did get Earthbound. My dad got it for me for my birthday. I believe he got it for probably around 20 bucks. And I actually, I have a clip here that I would love to share with all of you of me getting Earthbound when I was 12 years old. Earthbound! Yeah! Oh yeah! Super NES, huh? Yeah. Blast from the past. You have that, Brian? Yeah, my brother. I remember reading about it in Nintendo Power first, at around age four, seeing the ad and being like, wow, this looks cool. I started getting Nintendo Power uh, before Earthbound ever came out, and I actually got to read about the coverage of the game before it ever came to North America. So even then, like even looking at some of the stuff in Nintendo Power, I was like, man, that looks that looks neat, that looks different. Like, Nintendo Power had this uh, spread, you know, that was about Earthbound. The Geek, I think, was the, the issue where they talked about the Geek, the Geek Invades. Uh, and I, you know, I didn't know what was going on. Like, that was back when I would just read Nintendo Power front to back. And so I was really hooked. Like, that, the clay models really grabbed onto me. I thought the game graphics were going to be like clay. I had no idea what kind of game it was like, but was curious just based on that. So then, I think there was a subsequent issue where they did a much bigger, like, exploration. And that might have been the one where they had a coupon. I'm pretty sure there was a coupon for the game, so I ripped that out and went to Target and bought it. Really, my earliest memory of the game proper is just opening the box and reading the player's guide in the back of the van on the way home. Nintendo Power had these really elaborate and strange advertisements for the game that were actually pretty gross. Everyone knows this game stinks campaign. This game stinks. 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 This game stinks? This game stinks and it's like a giant fart cloud. This game stinks. Like it got my attention as uh, you know, I'm 14 or whatever, 13. And I was like, ah, oh, cool, slime and farts. I, I thought it was great. I remember scratch and sniff, scratching those pages of my Nintendo Power magazine with the advertisements of the game. And, and you got these putrid smells of the different monsters that were in Earthbound, the different enemies. And and this for, for this somehow was supposed to actually encourage you to buy the game. It made me think Nintendo really did the game dirty. They could have done a much better job of presenting it. Though, again, I just don't know how they would have. It's hard to explain in a magazine spread. A lot of people look back and they say that it was really bad marketing. And like, I guess to a degree it was, right? But it, it really did fit a little bit into the 90s aesthetic. In of... hindsight, I think it did. Everything with the cartoons and slime. I mean, this was the mid 90s. This is like the Ren and Stimpy, Beavis and Butthead decade. So when they're like, this game smells like your underwear, that made perfect sense. That, that, is, that is Nickelodeon gack. That is absolutely what all commercials and magazine advertisements were. The marketing for Earthbound was kind of seared into my memory. I definitely remember, and it was probably part of, you know, the push to say like, the marketing, ah, they, you know, this would have been good if the marketing had, you know, only, if they'd only done it right, you know, if you only really marketed Earthbound the right way. It, it wasn't the most ridiculous yeah. marketing plan. It, it feels like that in hindsight, but it, it wasn't so crazy at the time. And I, I don't think that it turned me off as a kid. I mean, well, clearly it didn't. You still bought it. I still bought it. I think that the Earthbound marketing campaign has become more infamous now than it was back then. I wasn't aware of it at all. In retrospect, uh, they did a good job, you know, like, especially given the source material. Like when I think about Earthbound, I think about the players, guys. The first thing that comes in my mind, and that's that was one of Nintendo Power's deals, you know, like they did that. I can appreciate it was really hard for Nintendo to try to sell this game without being able to show it in a video format. This was the 90s where that was just not an option. And even if it was an option, it's still impossible. It's it's all about the story. And to present that in a magazine, it's just not gonna happen. The green fart clouds and the pizza and the scratch and sniff really stands out in my mind as Earthbound. And I understand that like in Japan, it's a little different because they, you know, different approach to marketing, different materials, different everything. I think of Mother 2 and Earthbound as two different games in a way. 
Like Mother 2 is this kind of different thing. It's got a different, you know, feel and flavor. Earthbound has this, you know, um, more almost like Nickelodeon, you know, feel to it. And I really like that. This game did not flop because Nintendo had a marketing campaign that said this game sucks, don't play it. The, 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 the this game stinks was a joke and it was that was 90s that was mid 90s as hell i think the reason why earthbound didn't work was because it was a parody of rpgs of jrpgs a genre that was not big in america yet for a very broad audience for a nintendo audience remember this is a first party nintendo game they're expecting big big numbers right Anything pre Final Fantasy 7 for America, which is not going to do big numbers. I'm sure Mario RPG was a modest hit. Earthbound was a weird RPG without Mario, and it wasn't called Final Fantasy 7. What's my favorite part of the series? Can I say everything? Like, there's so many components that come together to create this elegant but chaotic mold. The original hook for me was the fact that it wasn't swords and shields, it was taking place in America or Japan's interpretation of America. It wasn't too far off in some ways. The fact that it was set in modern day, I, I think that was hands down the, the, the biggest appeal to me as a kid. And I remember very vividly that I was in, I was in second grade and I was playing through it every day after school in second grade. You wouldn't go to like summers and take I would, little vacations. I did. Mm. I imagined that I was like on vacation. I'm like, oh, I'm going on a vacation now. And I would walk the streets and talk to the people. You can go watch a concert if you want to. You can go to a shopping mall. You can order a burger. You can have pizza delivered to you. You can like buy a house if you want to. I spent so much time just, just an, an on it. Just an on it. Like yeah. it was it was actually it was it, looking back it was ridiculous, but like the the house that you can buy and on it, I bought that house before I ever went to Tucson. And that's such a weird thing to think about now, but like as a kid, it was actually kind of a imaginative escape for me in a way that felt more real than other games. You know, the Mushroom Kingdom is super cool but that doesn't have any grounding in reality like Earthbound did for me. In fact, I got a lot of my friends hooked onto it, and so they would come over and I'd be like, hey, do you want to go watch a concert? It's with a singer named Venus in Runaway 5, and we would listen to Venus sing, biggest quotes ever, sing for hours on end. Drove my parents mad, but it was fun. What's that? What's that? I don't know. Oh, what is that? Get a chair, get your, what, your chair. See, this is, um, this is Earthbound. Lift up the box. box. Careful. <gasps> really, like, the music has always been amazing. Oh my god, the music alone could be my favorite part of Earthbound. I feel like it would not be the same game at all without the soundtrack being as strong as it is. That funk soundtrack, a little bit of jazz in there. It's kind of all over the place, a little bit electronic. One that always stands out to me is after you've saved three and the song is all peaceful and nice for the first time and it feels like you've really made a difference for those people. The atmosphere set by the music I think is the best. Not even knowing that I was being exposed to like jazz and R&B and you know reggae and rock and metal, you know, like I didn't know what metal was when I was 13, but I knew how the Gigas battle made me feel, and that was largely because of the music. You know, I think personally, my favorite element to Earthbound is the the characters. They were just very normal kids. They look like and dress like normal kids. The only one who doesn't is the Kung Fu Master, Pooh. And that's not just the playable characters. I think that they're just kind of like a blank slate for you to project onto. But all of the enemies are very unique. Uh, you've got a new age retro hippie. You've got a rabid dog. You've got, you know, just 
real things that exist in the world. The police, uh, skater punks, you know, these are all people that you would see in the real world. I think like the general aesthetic is is something that I think I focus on as, a, as an artist, especially. The character designs are great. They're all so weird. Big bro and little bro from Mother 3, this little, little head with arms sticking out of his side and he's got a, a butt. <laughs> he's just got a butt and his little brother is bigger than him. It, it, it really informs my sense of humor, I think. Uh, it just really resonates with me. I mean, who doesn't love imperfect characters, like little little sculptures that they're, they're a little bit wonky, but uh, they're endearing for that reason. There's just so much to love. The humor is incredible. I honestly think maybe the main intrinsic part of all of these things that makes it so good, and possibly my favorite thing, is the humor. Because without the humor, it wouldn't be something that I would continue to think about, you know, some 25 years later. Even the music has humor in it. You know, like it, the way that it samples and the way that it, you know, refers to itself sometimes. It's one of the few RPGs of the time, man. You go, you talk to everybody in town. There's a store clerk, and if you go to the store clerk and you don't buy anything, she calls you out. She says, what, did you just come to say hi? What a loser. Or you have the sea captain who tells you that he threw his slippers at the beast while you were fighting it. Or you have the dude, I don't remember where he is, but he's like, my wife ran away for a second time. I'm such a lucky man. Like, the, the, it's just so funny. Sometimes you, you wonder, like, is this even intentionally funny? But it's, it's hilarious. <laughs> And sometimes it's just like obviously the result of just a well-crafted, you know, like timing, like comedic timing. There's something special about having a favorite video game series and being able to go back to it and discover new things. And I think Earthbound's writing is so meticulously crafted and full of incredible jokes and lines that'll catch you completely off guard. And even if you've played the games over and over again, every time you go back, the writing will still put a smile on your face. It has great humor. <laughs> it has endearing characters. It has an emotional roller coaster that has laughter, sadness, and all those other aspects that make a good story a good story. I like how they're weird, and I, I always I like how they get dark. I like how the the closing minutes to uh, Mother Two Earthbound, like that fight with Gygus is wild really, really goes places. And then, of course, Mother 3 is a profoundly depressing game. The emotional heartstring tugging that is done. I mean, Mother yeah. 3 gets a lot of credit for that, but yeah. there, there's parts in all of the games there are that are extremely emotional. The characters are all really wacky and quirky, and it still manages to be really engaging and emotional when it needs to be, right? When there's a story peak, you can't help but cry over some of these characters, which is so bizarre because at the same time, you're playing through this game where NPCs are telling you, oh, I'm not that important to the story. Don't worry about it. You don't need to talk to me. Like, it's really weird how Earthbound manages to sort of tonally change so drastically from scene to scene while also feeling really cohesive. These games somehow know how to delicately pour you a, a heaping bowl of reality and then they'll throw it in your face and then tell you a fart joke afterwards to make sure that you're doing okay. There's definitely a lot of dark and somber moments, but the general tone is this light-hearted and comedic nature and I think that makes the hard moments hit even harder. And combining that with the sorts of enemies you encounter, the situations you find yourself in, the locations, you know, it all plays together to make a, a huge complete product that you really, I don't think I can even think of another game that quite pulls it off in the same way. It's not like it's trying to be so many different things at once. It just has like a personality and the personality is weird. I really mean this in the most non-sarcastic way possible. But the games feel like they were written by the most intelligent child you've ever met. Because it feels like the people that wrote the game understand the struggles you're going through. But somehow those writers, a toy and the team, haven't lost that magic that only a child truly knows. All of the little things are the parts that I remember the most. The Mr. Saturn who says Dakota. It's just, <laughs> it's all the little things that just add up and make the game you know, my favorite. 
some of the aspects to the gameplay, you know, like the fact that you, you could see the enemies on the field and that like when you hit them from behind, there was like a green swirl to like, signify that you got them from behind. Or if you ran away and they got you from behind, they did the red swirl. One of my favorite memories is just watching like I, I would I played the game and just early on you you meet the character Buzz Buzz, which is a bee. And I liked the animation of Buzz Buzz because when he was buzzing around, it, I don't know, like it just it looked like an actual bee was on my screen because it was just it was, it was a very smooth animation and I think those are just like the memories that just stick out the most about Earthbound it's just the smaller things because it's it's a very relatable game with how you can relate to it just being you know kids going around their town and going on a little adventure it's, it is a game with so many layers surface level with so much the, the parody and the characters and the dialogue, there's so much surface level happening there, but there's always depth to just about everything that's in these games. They get you, they get you with that cute stuff. They get you with the, the cute, silly aesthetic, but they really, I love a game that can really just all of a sudden turn the knife on you, really kick you in the chest. And uh, these games do it masterfully. It's, it's worth replaying over and over again, just to experience that sleight of hand, that, that switch again. Has anyone noticed the translation in Earthbound Beginnings? The stilted, outdated word choices make everything feel extremely surreal, and kind of scary. I think this is great and lends the game a unique atmosphere compared to Earthbound. I think the best example is the forgotten man of Magi Kant. In the Japanese version, he's a slightly tough guy who just considers being forgotten his hobby, and by paying attention to him, you're getting in his way. In the English version, due to the phrasing and some slight mistranslations, he instead sounds like a meek and pathetic man who wants nothing more than to give into his own loneliness and depression. He easily has the most depressing monologue of any character on the NES, making him, ironically, maybe more unforgettable than the Japanese version. Earthbound makes me feel, I mean, Earthbound now, now in my 30s, Earthbound makes me feel nostalgic. Yes. And there's there's a, a certain happiness that cannot be explained, but also familiarity. I mean, I've, I've played through Earthbound a lot. I mean, a whole lot. I mean, the music just makes me smile now, even. RPGs were good for summer vacation. Like, okay, I got plenty of time. I can just sit on and chew through this RPG. And of course, now that I'm an adult, that, that I don't really have summer vacation anymore. But when I play Earthbound, I it takes me back to, like, elementary school summer vacation. When I think about Earthbound, I mostly think about nostalgia, but... That nostalgia is everything about being young, not just the fact that it's a retro video game. It reminds me of being a kid, rather than it reminding me of a thing I enjoyed as a kid. It's about learning more about the world, seeing how these characters deal with the situation they're in, the fact that most of them don't even know that there's a situation going on, and that adults are not really that interested in kids' problems. The, the freedom of being a kid who can sit down and dump 40 hours into a game over the course of a couple days. You know, like, that's a very specific time in most people's lives, and it comes and goes. So, you, you know, there's a longing for that. And I think that's probably the main thing that I remember when I play the game now. It's like, oh my gosh, I remember, like, you know, being at this part, and, uh, like, I wanted to show it to my friends, and they kind of, they kind of, like, you know, bounced off it. I was like, oh, all right, whatever, well, you know. And then I just stayed up all night and kept playing, and I just, you know, even though, you know, the narrative of the game is that, like, yeah, you're, you're fighting, you know, these cosmic, you know, forces and you've got to struggle against, you know, this, this evil. The video game embodiment of a road trip is how I feel about Earthbound. Like, you get to go on this adventure and you got to grab some snacks and, you know, you're going to go with your friends and you're just going to have a good time. You're going to be screwing around and laughing and just seeing weird stuff. I don't know what's going on there, but that was cool. That, that's how I feel about Earthbound. It's a road trip. I think the games do a great job of making you feel a lot of things just because they start you off and it's sort of like a happy-go-lucky game, but they are not afraid to like totally stab you in the heart <laughs> with, the, the, with the moments in the game. So I think despite the fact that it's always been on you know, hardware that's not you know, cinematic, they're still able to pull those emotions out of you and I think that really is just a testament to how well it's written. You know, like, you'll, you'll get this, this really heartfelt, deep message 
from a walking nose. You know, <laughs> it, offers you, it offers you coffee and suddenly you're getting, like you're receiving this really beautiful, like, it's like an intermission. You don't even know who's talking. You just suddenly like, oh wow, I'm getting, I'm just reading a letter now. And just like the game totally interrupts the flow. I remember when I was playing it, I was like, I felt, I felt things, you know, like, and I thought about the fact that I was feeling things. I was like, why is this making me feel weird? You know, like, this is a weird thing to be happening. Get me back in the game. But then you read this text and it's like, you know, I'm really proud of how far you've come and like, you know, what you've done. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> These games run you through the human gambit of emotions. You'll cry, you'll laugh, you'll worry, you'll feel proud and strong. You might even want to call up a friend and tell them that you love them. It gives me all the warm and fuzzies. You know, Earthbound is, to me, the most special and important video game I've ever played. It's, it's one of those things where people are like, what's your favorite game of all time? And you know, usually people take a breath and they hem and they haw. Like for me, number one is and will always be Earthbound. I would equate it to a cold winter evening where you're sitting in front of the fireplace, the fire's crackling, you're maybe cuddled up on the couch, you got a blanket around your shoulders, you got a cup of hot chocolate, maybe peppermint hot chocolate with a little bit of whipped cream. And you take that first sip of the hot chocolate with your surroundings as cozy as they can be and all of your problems just sort of melt away. That's how Earthbound feels to me. I think it's a game where you're free to be emotional, but you're cozy while in that really vulnerable state. And I cannot think of another franchise that's like that. I really can't. And I think it's a big reason why, I'm like almost getting choked up talking about it. It's a big reason why these games mean so much to me, even all these years later. In some ways, Earthbound has a way of making you feel like You've gotten to know the people who made it. Like there's the personality is just right there on the surface. Like you can just you, you can tell there's a person there who made this, which is not something you always think about when you play a game. Like the idea of, with games is to be immersive, and you know you don't you don't think about the the meta of it. But I do with Earthbound. I think like oh my gosh, like what what was this joke in Japanese? And like you know what was Marcus thinking when he localized it? Like. <laughs> Like, you know, where where in the world did the idea for magic cake come from? Like, is it that in Japanese? I guess just Clyde about that, you know? <laughs> I just think about the fact that I'm playing a game that people made when I'm playing it, which I don't, I don't do that a lot with other games. These days, the most joy that I get out of Earthbound is seeing other people experience it for the first time. Yes. Uh, I was just sitting there waiting for it to come to the Nintendo Switch. First off, I'm so glad it did, right? But then also, to see people tweeting me after the game launched and say, you know, you've talked about this for years and years and years. I finally got to play it. It's fantastic. It's it's it stands up to the test of time. Like that makes me feel so good. And um, there's people who are right. Like it's good. It's it is that good. It really is. It just it just makes me really happy, and I could just gush about it. And it just makes me so incredibly thrilled that more people are discovering Earthbound every day. So, uh, yeah, it's... Uh. Recently I had to explain it to a Japanese friend, so I was able to start with it's a game made by Shige Sato Itoi. And they were like, huh? The famous copywriter. That was really surreal. So Itoi's gone on record multiple times saying that there will not be a Mother 4, there's no plans for Mother 4. Uh, if there is another Mother game that he'd love to play it, and I, you know, I think fans can take him at his word on that. But I think more, more accurately, he said that like, Mother 4 is what you do. Like as a fan of the game, that's Mother 4. Like you, you living your life and, you know, going out and creating things. That's just really beautiful. You know, like how, gosh, he's so good. <laughs> like what a, what a beautiful sentiment. And to see it, it's not just a sentiment, it's the truth. Mother 4 is, you know, what the fans do. I think there's actually a lot of truth in that. And I think that I would like to see Earthbound return as the fan games. Just look at Undertale. Undertale was entirely inspired by Earthbound. And if Earthbound didn't exist, Undertale wouldn't exist. And Undertale takes the same concepts of Earthbound, but then pulls them into the gameplay. Shikasato Itoi gave us this series, gave us this trilogy of games. We have and we should continue to take it from here.
It belongs to us now. Part of the problem, I think, is that, like you said, Itoi doesn't want to make another game. And me personally, I don't know that I really want to see the series continue without Itoi because the story and, and the world of Mother is just so tied to Itoi as a person. It's kind of like Star Wars. Like, it's weird. It's weird to see the way that, let's say, Disney is making Star Wars compared to the way that George Lucas made Star Wars because so much of Star Wars is, is tied to who Lucas was as a person. And it's the same with Itoi. Without the original director involved, I just don't think that's going to happen. Uh, and it certainly won't be on the same level as the originals. The story is very personal, I think, to Itoi. And without, you know, some of his actual experiences being translated into... I mean, it's obviously not a direct uh, translation into a video game, but it is a translation of the feelings that he has about things. And I think that without him involved, there, there can't really be much of a future for the series. So if you if someone else were to try to continue the series, I don't know that it would ever feel the same. That's not to say that I wouldn't want to see someone try. The miraculous thing about Mother and Earthbound is that it was it was a bad word. Nintendo did not even like talk about didn't want to say Mother Earthbound publicly. So the fans just kind of were left alone, though. I don't believe there are a whole lot of cease and desist orders that were, you know, handed down. So this community was kind of led to grow. So I do believe that, like, you know, Mr. Itoi has talked about, like, he doesn't want to make a fourth one. I don't think that he needs to. I think that that style is so uh, beloved and so influential that there doesn't need to be a mother for from him, from Nintendo. It would be great if they did it. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be impossible. And if it came out, I too would love to play it. Even if Etoy isn't involved, I think there's a lot of talented designers and developers, even, you know, on Nintendo or elsewhere that could definitely take, take the reins and do more with the Mother series. I think there's a lot of value in continuing the series. I think the series can do wonderful things, commentary and new ideas, new designs, all of that stuff. There's so much more you can do with Earthbound and Mother. If we're going to continue the series in any sort of way, I would love to see someone like Toby Fox, the guy that created Undertale. I think Toby Fox understands what makes Earthbound and Mother so special. Toby would do something incredible with it. So please, Toy son if you're listening, please hand the reins over to Toby Fox and allow Nintendo to make Mother 4. Please, I beg of you. I would love to see Toby Fox work on his own mother game under supervision of a toy. Maybe that would be too surreal <laughs> of a task. It's like meeting your hero, but then also developing a game with them. Maybe that's too much. But I think Toby Fox would respect it. And I think with everything he's done, I think a toy would trust him. We would trust him, but only if he wants to. That would be really cool. But, you know, I don't know if that's ever going to happen. I hope it does. <laughs> There should not be another mother game without Shige Sato Itoi. It was created at his personal direction. Itoi was that that the the person who really thought of all the parody aspects. Let's make fun of this. Let's play in the let's play with these toys and you know he's not a game creator, but he's a very smart creative person. So he was just one of these kind of people that could he was an outsider that could come in and really bring something new, a different perspective. If you were up to 12 at this point, would any of them be so impactful? I think it would take something away. I think it's quite a powerful statement to just end at 3. Zelda wouldn't do that. Mario wouldn't do that. Fire Emblem wouldn't do that. And the big reason for that is because they make money. And to just end a series is quite an artistic statement that we don't see in film or games or just even literature a lot of the time. I think that if they were going to go back to it, the only thing they could really do is a remake, uh, try and make it more in line with the original art material that came along with it, because I know a lot of people associate the games with the art that they released of claymation style characters, and, you know, it, it was a little bit more high def than the classic SNES, you're 16 pixels tall, you know. Maybe even just remasters, obviously, <laughs> you know, I've, I've got a vested interest in the idea of a remaster of of Mother 3 specifically, but... The original three games uh, remastered in some way, remade in some way, whether it's in kind of a, uh, a new style, like like what Grezzo did with Link's Awakening. If Grezzo could actually be handed the series... Grezzo, please remake Earthbound. A company like Grezzo could make 
like they did with Link's Awakening, they could make a really nice 3D remake. And I'm always down for like a remake, right? If they're gonna remake Earthbound or Mother 3 and they do it in the style of like Link's Awakening Switch, that would be great. The Link's Awakening remake, where it's the cutesy, yeah, 3D like, model. Yeah, like the little figure, like a tilt shift. Yeah, a little, tilt yeah. shifted thing. I think that would be really fun to do. Maybe with uh, Mother 1 Earthbound Beginnings in a quality of life upgrade sort of way. <laughs> I'd like to have a version of Earthbound Beginnings with a better translation, uh, better balanced difficulty, and just have it fit in more with what the series would become. And it's not the game's fault. It's from the era where memory was limited, there were a lot of limitations of the making games. Earthbound Beginnings, it's a chore to play that game. You are rewarded with some incredible dialogue though, and fun characters. We have the technology. We can rebuild them. So doing something like that, but you know, realizing that art style in game form, I think would be amazing. And it would also, you know, give them a chance to go and uh, change some things and tweak some things for the better in those games to make them more uh, refined for a modern uh, player. More uh, quality of life improvements to the game, as well as a couple of features that weren't featured in the original game. Like I'd still want like the overhead look that's in the original, but it'd be really cool to be able to also switch the camera to over the shoulder, you know, so that you can get an all new perspective. I'm the boundary break guy, so it just ends up being one of those things I'm really fascinated by. But I would love that more than anything. And I actually, I hope that more than I hope for Mother 4, is, yeah. is I sincerely hope that uh, we can get I mean, I hope that we get Mother 3 just officially someday. Yeah, that too. Um, but beyond that, I'd love to see some different takes on the pre-existing games. I think that would be fun. Would I like to see Mother 3 brought to the West? Of course. <laughs> Why wouldn't I? Is the sky blue? Does grass typically grow green? I would absolutely die if Nintendo localized Mother 3. For the love of God. Yes. Bonus points if Reggie announces it, that would just be like... It's notorious, right? Like everyone's talked about Mother 3. I don't know a single time Nintendo has announced anything and people haven't immediately brought up Mother 3. So the fact that they haven't released it is ridiculous. I feel like so many gaming dreams have come true. Shenmue 3, The Last Guardian, Final Fantasy 7 Remake. But Mother 3 is like the last pillar of all of those. If it comes to the West, you can play it and realize how unoriginal I am. Frankly, I've already done like a gigantic advertisement by directing that Mother 3 trailer, so... But we can't even play that! We made a gigantic advertisement for a game that nobody can buy. <laughs> Nintendo, fix it! I mean, I think it goes without saying I would like to be able to play Mother 3 in English, officially! <laughs> Just go on the record, like, it'd be nice. Make it happen. I would love to see Mother 3 come to the West officially, just because I'm I'm upset that it hasn't. I want people to experience it. And yeah, we have the fan translation. This enables us to play the game in some capacity. But if Nintendo officially localized it and allowed the masses to experience what we love, it would just be heartwarming. I don't care if it's a remake. I don't care if it's a port. If they take the fan translation that Tomato and the team made and just put that out there, that would be incredible. The, the most important thing to, to get on the table here is that the the fan translation is extremely good. It's a, I, very, very good. I know that those words are going to turn people off. They're like, oh, fan translation. It is a professional translation. I know the people personally that worked on it. It is incredible. And in a lot of care and knowledge oh, and yes. experience with translating has gone into it. And that's an excellent translation because it goes out of its way to try to be as like, faithful to the game as possible. And in doing so, it, it probably touches on some elements that are maybe a little bit more controversial uh, in certain people's eyes. I think if you look at the heart of what it's all about, I don't know that it really warrants any controversy, but but there's a danger there that Nintendo would want to try to constrain or, or I, I struggle to use the word censor, but you know, just change something about it that makes it feel less less authentic to the original game in Japan. It's, it's one of those things that I'm, I'm always a little worried because whenever I, I talk about the, 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 the fan translation, like I know some people want to avoid it because they're like, I want to play it officially. In many ways, the fan translation would be better than any official translation that came out because the people that worked on it were such hardcore Earthbound fans and were able to adjust things to fit what an Earthbound fan's knowledge would be 
while still keeping true while to the still keeping Japanese. true it mm -hmm. it is an incredible piece of work the reality is that if they were to try to localize it there would probably be a lot of changes nintendo likes to take liberties with the intent and that's just to make it feel more culturally rele relevant i think you know there, there's a lot to mother 3 where there there's a lot of elements that you know would have to be changed if nintendo did we would buy it but that game goes hard it has a lot of stuff that i don't think nintendo wants to touch anymore that being said i think that the game should be released officially absolutely because there are people that no matter what they're not going to play it unless it's mm -hmm. it's it's out and I get that. For and accessibility. I, and I, for accessibility. And I get that and I understand that. And, and for that reason alone, more people need to experience Mother 3. I think for the sake of people who just want to play an officially sanctioned version of the game, it would be great to have it in the West. Mother 3 is a great game, you know, and I know that not everyone's going to go through the same hoops that I did in order to experience it. So if Nintendo put it out officially, it would just be a way for other people to play and an excuse for me to play it again. Would things get changed? I'm sure they would. I'm sure some things would get changed. <laughs> but should it should it, should it still exist? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, especially because there's so many people out there, even now, that are Earthbound fans. That they've played Earthbound, they love it, and they've never touched Mother Three. I think if they were ever going to bring it over, remake it, right? Fully remake it, modern visuals, make it look similar to what Curiomatic did with that amazing fan-made video of like a Mother 3 remake. I think that would be ideal. Otherwise, I am perfectly content replaying it on my Game Boy Micro. I don't ever need it to come over here. Yeah, ultimately, like, you know, it's, it's a business decision for Nintendo of America. You know, is it gonna make sense? And also, Nintendo Japan is just allowing resources to be spent on that. I mean, this is a... 16-year-old Game Boy Advance game. I believe that Mother 3 is the one that got away. I don't think it's gonna happen. I would like to see it though, but I've, it's been so many years, I've kind of given up. <laughs> I've given up hope. We're sitting here, it's 2022. At this point, I mean, it's been, what, it came out in 2006, so it's been 16 years. <sighs> if it's not come out now, I don't know. I don't know, there's some hope because you see like in the last Nintendo Direct we got Live Alive, which never came out in the West and I don't know the specific reasons why it didn't, but we're now getting it. And people like to say that that game was like Square Enix's or Squaresoft's Mother 3. There's always just a little bit of hope left. Um, do I want to see it? Yes, as long as they can keep it faithful to the original game. They actually did apparently release it for the, uh, the Wii U Virtual Console in Japan. And that's it. That's the only other time Mother 3 has been released ever. <laughs> and so it's like, whew, come on, there's so much potential there. There's there's so much you could do with that. So I, I hope they get around to it. Like, I, I imagine they will. Every E3, every Nintendo Direct, I'm always just keeping my fingers crossed, hoping and hoping and hoping. This is a game that is such a a big part of Nintendo's history. I mean, like I said, with Smash Brothers, so many people know about Earthbound from Smash Brothers, and there's a lot of Mother 3 content in that game. Lucas is from Mother 3, and there's a bunch of people that just, you know, like, just like, why, why, there, there's no reason why you should, you would know about this, this character, because like, this character has not made any official appearance in North America outside of Smash Brothers. It's just very odd to me that Nintendo of America w will do seemingly anything Mother 3 related outside of actually bring Mother 3 uh, to English speaking audiences, but I would love to see it. The main reason for Mother 3 to come out now is to support the series and to support the fact that this game is important and does something that other games don't do. And the only way that we can actually demonstrate that, we can post online, we can make videos about it, but we need to show it with our wallets. Sadly, that's the world we live in. And if we can't do that, we can't tell Nintendo that we like this product. And I want more of games like it. Maybe not another Earthbound, but another game that does the same thing. Something unique, something special. I think people should play these games to just feel something. It's hard to narrow it down to just one thing, but I'd call it a game about the moments, where rather than telling a big epic story with you know tons of twists and turns and all that, it's really more about the people and about 
experiencing really weird stuff that happens that'll stick with you and all of the little moments throughout the game. There's so many little things that make the world feel alive and I think those experiences are what will carry you through the game. These days, I'd probably say, man, don't you want to know what inspired Undertale? <laughs> Without Earthbound, we wouldn't have zany RPGs like Undertale today, Like this set the groundwork for those. Earthbound, the closest you can really get is Undertale, and even then, Undertale is inspired by Earthbound, but it really is its own thing. The kind of quirky quality to those games and those sensibilities, they, they would not exist without Earthbound. I mean, in some ways, Earthbound is kind of a, it's almost like a historical prerequisite. You know, for a lot of for a lot of people who want to be involved in games now, it's not something that anybody should feel obligated to play. But boy, is there a lot to discover there. Like if you understand, you go into it knowing like, yeah, this is a game from the 90s. I think, you know, you go into it with an open mind and you will find a, a lot to love. To know that this game changed so much and did so much in its time, like you need to play it for that. I do believe it holds up pretty well on its own, though. I still think it's it's not quite like anything else out there. I think other people should play the series just to experience something so different, but th there's, there's a profound feeling that Earthbound leaves you. There's nothing else really like it. It can teach us even now, even though it's a 25-year-old video game, there's things in there that we just, we don't see anymore. It's just, it just goes to show you that Games can be so much more than just a form of interactive entertainment, right? It can really bond families and bring people closer together and really establish some fun and cement, rather, some fun childhood memories. Anybody who's played Earthbound, I think they don't stop talking about it for a reason. Those people that played it at first loved it and talked about it. And it was one of the first like cult internet games that I ever became really aware of. I think if it's not the, you know, the, the warm and fuzzy story that kind of like, that comes out of it. It's a game you have to be patient with and spend time with. And on the inside was a very, very unique and rewarding gaming experience. You just had to give it time. You had to dig through the earth, so to speak, get down to the core of Earthbound. We're so fortunate that we do have Earthbound in the digital mediums we do because sometimes a lot of these old classic games get tossed to the wayside and then we don't get to play them anymore and it's really sad. It's absolutely a joy to play. Everyone should experience it. And now with it coming to the Nintendo Switch Online service, there's very little excuse. So many, the, the Switch install base is so huge. Everyone should take the time to, to play it. I think that if there is a time when people should try to play Earthbound, it's now. The fact that it's now actually available on a modern console, you can play it legitimately anywhere in the world. That access to those old games, as a kid, I would have killed for it. As an adult, we should be taking advantage of these things. It might be relevant now, 25 years after it's released, but in another 25 years, I don't know if we're going to be the, in a position where people will want to go back to play it. So I, I used to worry more about like, people being disappointed or just like hyping it up too much. And then, you know, people being like, oh, is this all it is? Cause like, it's, it's a product of its time. You know, it's not like this technological marvel. The people who play it and really catch on to it, like uh, you, you've got a neat connection there, you know? That's, you know, they, they realize like, oh man, they know what's up. They really, they, they're, they're onto something special. Like we've got, we've got the same wavelength. So. The series is special to us. One of the reasons is um, we actually met through Earthbound. I was a part of a website called Starman.net, which is a Earthbound fan site. Contrary to popular belief, it's not a dating site, even though it has led to many, many marriages, ours included. We've been married now for over 10 years. It means a lot for other people to experience the game because it's it's the game. Like my, my favorite game is Earthbound. Mouse's favorite game is Mother 3. Like the these this series is like Yeah. It it has our heart. So And not to mention so many of our friends that we've met through Sarman.net, through Earthbound. So yeah. And Yeah, a lot of a lot of our personal friendships, personal personal relationships, even business relationships, uh, are through Earthbound. Um And it, some of those people also got married. <laughs> Yeah, because of it. It's it's been it's been a wild adventure. Like it's 
<laughs> the game is powerful. The, ga the game has like these magic powers. They seep into your soul, man. They really do. One of my favorite little chestnuts about Earthbound is the fact that fans to this day continue to find these little snippets of dialogue just totally hidden. Like you've got to do this very specific, you know, path, this series of events have to happen. And if you like check, check an item that you only have in your inventory for just a few minutes, uh, you know, after you've done something, then you'll get this funny little description that was just like hidden in there. And it's, it's like a little time capsule. Like none of the fans knew about it. Somebody posted about it on Twitter and everybody's like, oh, it's so good. Like, you know, there's, there's a beef jerky recipe hidden in the game. If you look in one of the item descriptions, you know, just, just like it, it speaks a lot again to the creators and how much fun they had. Like we've got to we've got to really build this out so that even if somebody goes in this really edge case scenario, they get a little something. You just get a little present. I think it's just rare. It's just rare to find a series of games that has been this consistently good and has been this consistently loved for this long. It wasn't popular at the time because the graphics were kind of reminiscent of Charlie Brown, but over time it's grown to be a cult classic that's stuck in the hearts of fans for almost 30 years. There is a level of heart that you just don't see in very many games. And that's something that can never age. That heart will be there forever. I would say play Earthbound 2 and play, you know, Earthbound and Mother 3. Play Earthbound to begin with. You don't need to play Mother 1 in order to enjoy Earthbound. It does everything Mother 1 did, but does it better. You should give it a go, because why not? You're gonna watch a video about it, why not play it? It really is easier than ever. Anybody, if you have a Switch and Switch Online, you just play Earthbound. Just go play it right now. Yeah, just do it for me. That would make me very happy. If, if it was easier to play Mother 3, I would recommend that one first in a heartbeat. You, you just have to play it, honestly. You just play it, trust me, play it. You're gonna love it. Play the, play the, play the fan translation. Now I wanna go play it again. <laughs> play it, play the fan translation. For the love of God, give us Mother 3. Call your mother, she misses you. All right, don't get homesick. All right, get your skip sandwiches and call your mother. I know it's hard, but no crying until the end, okay?